Well, good morning. It's such a pleasure to be with you and uh, an honor as well. Uh, my name is John Laurie, and <clears throat> I work at Trout Lake Camps. And uh, I have had some great conversations this morning already with some um, folks who've been involved there, uh, volunteering in different capacities. And we just appreciate you so much. And we also, I've seen some people here whose faces I've seen at Trout. And it's great to, uh, great to be here. Um, always love being here at Glory Baptist. So thank you so much for having me here. Um, I feel like I'm a little late to the party uh, with a third pitch for volunteers. Uh, but we have, uh, <laughs> I've got that bag of pretzels. Um, but um, we are looking for some uh, young men. Um, we are in dire need of some young men to serve uh, as counselors this summer. So if you are a high school graduate and you want to serve the Lord even for a few weeks, um, I do see there's some young men here. Um, we are paying um, uh, for um, coming even for a few weeks, and there's some other added bonuses in there. So if you're interested, please find me afterwards. We also would love to have um, some young women as well. Um, and if you're interested, uh, talk to me after the service. So, But um, before I begin, um, let's, uh, would you please join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. And Lord, your word tells us that it is a, uh, a sword that pierces to, um, between the marrow and the bone. And it just gets down to the heart of things, Lord. And we just pray that today your word would do that, that it would um, give us, um, give to those who believe assurance and for those who are searching today that it would provide not only the answer but the power um, that they need to come to you. Um, Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would move through the preaching of your word. I pray that you would be with me. And I pray that you would encourage us and feed us today from your word and draw us closer to your son, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Well, please open your Bibles with me to John chapter 5. And no, I didn't pick this book just because it's my name. Although that's, that's always a, a good, good uh, idea if you can't think of what to do. Um, and please turn to chapter 5, verses 19 through 30. And as we begin um, this morning, this is our text for today. Now, uh, just to give you a little background, Jesus has just healed a paralyzed man on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees are criticizing him for this. And Jesus has taken this opportunity to heal this man on the Sabbath to talk about how he and his father um, share the same work. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. For the father loves the son, and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, 
And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. And those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So let's begin here this morning. Let's get... uh, uh, a little involved here. And what I'm going to ask you to do is I have a couple of questions and I'm going to have you um, raise your hand if the answer is yes for you. All right. So we'll start off with an easy one. How many of you have a body? <laughs> All right. So that was an easy one. Okay. How many of you have a soul? How many of you have a soul? Fantastic. All right. Now, how many of you believe your soul will outlast your present body? Raise your hands. All right. I think that's a pretty good reason to pay attention to Jesus' words here today. Um, Jesus teaches us that there will be two resurrections, one leading to eternal life and one leading to eternal punishment. We will all meet Jesus. But will you meet Jesus? Will you see him face to face in that moment as your savior or as your judge? Which way will it be? Well, I know from scripture the way that Jesus would like it to be. The way he'd prefer it is certain. He does not want to condemn you. And in the same book, the same gospel, um, Jesus tells us that he was sent into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That those who put their faith, those out of the world might pu- who put their faith in him might be saved. He wants for each and every one of us in this room to cross over from death to life. And that's the whole reason that he stepped out of heaven and became one of us and died on a cross so that we might cross over from death to life. So this is what Jesus wants for you. Um, He wants life. As we study Jesus' words today, we approach what can literally save our lives forever if we believe it. Many of you already do believe that. And so you might ask, okay, well, I already do believe. What does this passage hold for me? Well, I'm glad you asked that. We see three powerful truths that give us insight here into Christ's character. Um, Insight that forms his character in us. And they also, I believe, give us a sobering charge that we can share with the people in our lives. Maybe some of you are thinking about how to share the gospel. And I think this passage gives a very powerful Um, jolt of reality um, that also at the same time provides a powerful dose of God's love and his mercy. Um, And so this is something that as I walk through today, perhaps God will use this passage in in your mouths um, to share with your friends and loved ones and neighbors. So here's three truths we will see in the text. First, we must honor Jesus if we are to honor the Father. Um, We can't have a relationship with God um, outside of having a relationship with Jesus. Um, We can't say, oh yeah, um, I'm totally about God, but I'm not sure about placing my faith in Jesus. That doesn't fly. Um, Number two, faith is what honors Jesus and transfers us from death to life. So faith is essentially the wings of that airplane. It, it's what gets it off the ground. Faith is what honors Jesus and transfers us from death to life. And three, Jesus has authority to both save and condemn. So let's begin going through these verses. And please follow along with me in your Bibles. Now, um, there is, uh, as we read verse 19... 
um, Jesus says that there is something that he cannot do. Isn't that a funny way to think about it? There is something that Jesus can't do. Jesus can do everything, right? But he says that there's one thing that he cannot do. And what is that? What, the one thing that Jesus cannot do is that he cannot do anything outside of God's will. Now, Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath because his father, God the Father, also heals and saves around the clock. Uh, God does not uh, say, oh, sorry, I'm off hours right now. You'll have to come back after the weekend, fortunately. <laughs> so <laughs> Jesus is healing around the clock, and he makes a point of healing this man on the Sabbath when he knows that how the Pharisees will react so that he can bring this point out. He is doing the same thing that his father does. He is working... Jesus doesn't try to sidestep this issue. He brings, he meets this controversy head on so that he can show my father is working and I am working. I am working on the Sabbath just as my father is working. Now the world tells us that power gives license to do as you please. Um, we all kind of grow up and we say things um, when we, uh, right before we leave home, like, well, when I am an adult, I'm going to stay up till two in the morning and I'm going to eat spaghetti every night. Well, maybe I'm the only one who said that, but we all have these things, these ideas of what we're going to do when we get older. We're going to, um, I remember talking with this little boy, uh, who was in first grade, and he was like, when, I, when I'm 19, I'm going to have a Corvette. Oh, really? Yeah, but not a pink one. Okay. It's going to be tan. And he was just telling me all these plans that he had. Well, it's the same thing. We all have this idea of if we just had more money or if we just had more power, we'd get to do what we really want. Well, here's Jesus, the Son of God. He has all power. He's stopping storms. He's raising people out of beds where they've been paralyzed for years. And yet, to all appearances, he's just a simple traveling rabbi who had worked. He had calluses on his hands. And he wasn't dressing ostentatiously. There was nothing special from the outside about him that said, this is the Son of God. Um, There's no declaration of earthly power about him. And he tells us here that he cannot work outside of his Father's will. Our, is our attitude like that? Do we think like that? Do I think to myself as I rise each morning, I don't want to do anything outside of God's will. Now, I don't think that that means that we need to somehow think that we need to know God's secret counsel that only he knows. But that as we go about our day in our relationships with others, are we directed by the love that Jesus had? Are we directed by that love for the Father that that basically gives the red or green light to the words or the actions that we do. God calls us to a partnership in his saving work. And we will learn more here in verse 20. Now in verse 20, Jesus says this, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. God is going to show us amazing things. But before he shows us amazing things in terms of miracles and amazing works, he shows us something even bigger and even more beautiful. I, I get goosebumps when I look at this passage, and, I'll, and we'll see here in just a moment. Jesus gives us a peek at the center of the universe. Before God even made the universe, this was 
the core. This is the center. Um, everything that exists in the universe exists for the sake of the relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The universe at every level is a canvas for the Father's love for the Son and the Son's love for the Father to be painted. God works not because he has to, like we do often, but because he is so full of glory that he spills over. He is so full of love for the Son, and the Son is so full of love for the Father that they make a world, and they make a world in which they make us in the image of God. And so as we, um, as we look at the universe, everything that exists, the smallest bug, um, the biggest star, exists for the glory of God. And God makes an audience to be wowed forever by this love. You know, you think about um, how all over the earth there's beautiful things, and yet there's a sense in which um, until um, there's this audience to see it um, and, and cheer for it, you know, um, there's something missing there. And so God... Um, God creates us as an audience to just enjoy this glorious canvas that he's painted. And he makes this audience to last forever. And the pinnacle of this masterpiece is his work of salvation. And he makes us as an audience to enjoy the benefits of salvation forever. I just get goosebumps thinking about this because he has made us to marvel at him forever. And one piece of that, one of the greatest wows is bringing the dead to life. Let's take a look at verse 21 now. Jesus clarifies more in this verse. For as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. So Jesus is doing the Father's work. He's doing miracle work, saving work. He's doing this work in the Father's shoes. And he's doing it with the Father's power. And Jesus literally raised the dead a few times. We can look back at the story of Lazarus. We can look back at, at um, a, a boy who was brought um, out, a little girl. Jesus brought people back to life literally several times. Um, but he also raises the dead by calling otherwise condemned people to believe in him and be saved. And so there is a way in which he did and will bring the dead to life, but he also is speaking here of spiritual deadness. What is that? That is the the position that we all stand before him in which we don't have life in ourselves before him. Um, when we know what God wants us to do, we don't do it. And so we stand under his condemnation. Why? Because God is just and holy. It doesn't mean he doesn't love us, but we need to be brought to life. And that greatest expression of his love is, is agreeing with him and saying, yes, Lord, I do stand guilty before you. I want what your son has to give me to bring me to life. I can't do this on my own. Now, are you lost today? There are possibly some people sitting in this room who need God in their lives in this way, who need to be called to life, need to be brought to life. And I, it is my earnest prayer that if you feel the Holy Spirit stirring you through Jesus' words here, that you will hear what he has to say and believe. He 
He can raise you from the dead. Will you let Jesus make you whole, just as he made this paralyzed man whole? Will you meet Jesus as your Savior and not your judge? Now in verse 22, we see that the Father has appointed Jesus to be judge of every person who has ever lived. God is not willing that any should perish. He sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but to save all who believe in him. Yet, if we neglect that salvation, we are condemning ourselves. Jesus has been sent here not to condemn you, but to save you. But if you turn your back on that salvation, uh, if you don't go out the right exit when the fire is burning down the building, then you are condemning yourself. Further insight comes in verse 23. This is why there is no other way to be saved. How we treat Jesus is how we treat the Father. Jesus is making this point that he's been sent here as the Father's representative. If we, um, He's been sent here to save. He's been sent here to judge. And how we treat him, how we receive his words, is how we are treating God the Father. That's why if we don't listen to what Jesus says, even when his word convicts us, maybe we don't like it right away. Maybe it, it, it makes us uh, feel convicted. And we're like, I, I don't like those words. Um, if we do not listen to him, then we are rejecting the words of God the Father. But if we do listen, even if we go through those feelings of conviction, those feelings that make us know, hey, I better sit up and listen here. Um, there is good news for those who believe. God makes it possible for us to be declared righteous so that we can be with him forever rather than being separated from him by certain judgment. Right here in verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Man, talk about some good news here. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. When we did our show of hands here, there was a feeling in the room of, wow, if you really think about it, eternity is very important to come face to face with. Um, and Jesus here brings us to the best possible news for each and every one of us that when we meet him face to face, um, we, his judgment, if we believe in him, our judgment happened at the cross. Jesus paid for our, all of our sins, every sin that we have done, ever will do. Jesus paid for those sins. And so if we believe in him, put our faith in him, we are not going to be judged. Um, we are going to pass from death into life. Um, and so this is good news. Uh, we, it means your eternal life can begin right now. So if you believe in Jesus as your Savior, um, you stand on the far side of sin, death, and hell. And you have passed from death into life. Um, this good news puts everything in your life into perspective. At verse 25. Every time someone believes, uh, they have passed from death into life. And this will be more evident on an epic scale when Jesus returns and we rise to meet him, preceded by those who have died in Christ. So let's take a look here at verse 25. Um, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. So here Jesus is speaking about the preaching of the gospel. And here he refers to himself as the Son of God. Later on he's going to talk about himself as the Son of Man. But as the Son of God, Jesus has authority that when people believe on what he has to say, 
um, those who believe in him will find that life that we just talked about. So let's go to verse 26. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. So just as we honor God the Father with faith, we need to honor God the Son with faith. We need to believe Jesus' words. Um, It comes from his unique relationship with the Father, um, this authority to save. Jesus is just like the Father, and that is why the Father has given him authority to save. At the same time, the Father gives Jesus authority to judge. Now, we will see this very um, clearly in verse 27. Daniel prophesied in Daniel 7.13, the final unending kingdom in which the Son of Man is given everlasting dominion over all people by the Ancient of Days. And when Jesus uh, ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God, as it talks about in Psalm 110, um, this happened. All authority was given to him in heaven and on earth. Jesus is that king, and judgment is a king's prerogative. Yet, in God's goodness, he set aside this time that we're living in between his first coming and his second coming in which uh, we have time to repent. Because remember that reason that God sent his son. He sent him not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And yet he is that king. He is that king who it's in his authority, uh, it's in his power as a son of man here, And notice how he talks about himself as both the Son of God and the Son of Man here. Um, It's his authority as Son of God to save and his authority as Son of Man to judge. And he's given us this time to repent and be saved. But if we do not, whether we do or whether we don't, Um, his authority will reign over us because he is the king over all creation. Uh, Verse 28, from speaking of spiritual rebirth, Jesus shifts to the more concrete future resurrection. So Jesus has talked about how the spiritually dead, those who will hear his voice, will live. Here he's going to talk about how in the future, at his second coming and then, um, later on, at the final judgment, the resurrection of the, the wicked, those who hear his voice will literally rise out of the graves. Um, Jesus' voice will summon all. Let's take a look here at verse 28. <clears throat> Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So these are two different resurrections. Um, We know from Paul's letters that at Jesus' coming, um, those who are in Christ, those who are alive, and those who have died in Christ will rise up and they will um, be with the Lord. We also know that there will be a final judgment in which all who have ever lived who have not received Christ will receive Christ. God's judgment at the white throne. Um, and so Jesus shifts to this very concrete reality. We, w- everyone will hear his voice. Everyone will rise to one of those two resurrections. But how will you hear his voice? That is what matters to you personally. That is what matters to each and every one of us. If you believe you will hear the voice of your beloved calling you home. You will hear the voice of your Savior. You will hear the voice of your friend. But if you do not believe, you will hear the voice of your judge calling you to judgment. There will be two resurrections, one for believers at the rapture and another for the wicked at the final judgment. Now, if this verse were taken out of context... Uh, Verse 29, some might say, well, I do good things. It says here, um, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, I do good things. So why why do you need this faith stuff? 
Why do I need to believe? Why is this faith stuff so important? Well, in God's eyes, we all fall short. And this verse, doing good, is better translated as doing what is noble. Now, what is doing what is noble in God's eyes? Um, Jesus answers this question for us in other places in the same gospel. Um, Faith in Christ is what God finds praiseworthy and what God wants to reward. Um, Doing good here is shorthand for believing in his son. Not earning our way, which we can't do. We can't. God doesn't need us to prove ourselves because we all fall short. All he wants us to do is to honor his son with faith because that honors him. If we don't believe, we reject God and practice what is evil because we essentially are calling God a liar if we don't believe him. Everyone will exist forever, but those who believe in Jesus will be resurrected to life while those who don't will rise to eternal condemnation. We gain further insight in verse 30. Verse 30 says this, I can do nothing on my own, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus is a just judge, because ultimately he carries out the Father's will. Everything Jesus does glorifies God the Father as both Savior and judge. The question stands, will you hear his voice and live? Today can be the first day of your eternal life. Ask Jesus to save you. And scripture gives you a promise that he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Not because of anything you do, but because Jesus has paid for every sin at the cross with his own blood. When we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. God wants to give you a brand new life. For those who already do believe, we have so many reasons here and here as we contemplate these sobering truths. We have so many reasons to praise God in this text that we could and will spend eternity praising him for the things that he's done. He's done this amazing saving work in which he brings us out of judgment and crosses us over from death to life. And that's amazing. And that is why, just one of many reasons why we praise God, why we gather here every Sunday to praise him. Um, We hear Jesus' voice as the voice of our beloved Savior, sent by a glorious and loving Father to give us abundant life, joined to his will and work. In Scripture, Jesus speaks to you and I. Hear his voice as the voice of your Savior, calling you home. Please pray with me.